Welcome to the RFP Success Show with host Lisa Rehurik, the number one sought-after authority on RFP success. Each week, we bring you information, strategies, or resources to help you win more business through RFPs and have a little fun doing it. Let's get this week's episode started. Welcome, everybody, to the RFP Success Show. I am your host, Lisa Rehurik, the number one sought-after authority on RFP success. So as you know, every week we bring you information strategy or resources to help you win more business through RFPs and hopefully have a little bit of fun doing it. So let's get this week's episode started. Today, I am giving you a teaching moment. So every once in a while, I will come in and just share some tips on a topic that I've been hearing a lot about, a hot topic that either I've had a lot of questions on or that I've seen a lot of mistakes around in the reviews of proposals that I've personally been doing or that my team's been doing. So we really want to make sure that we're sharing relevant information. And today's topic is super relevant. And I've been looking at a lot of RFPs recently that fit this bill that are making some of these simple mistakes. So I want to talk about them. And what we're talking about is when you're defending your own contract, there is nothing worse than when you have a contract, it's got to go up for bid because that's just the way it works. This is generally in a government environment. You've done as many contract extensions as you can, but now it's time for rebid. And there's nothing worse than losing that. It's your contract to lose at that point. And there are some things that you need to be doing to prepare for that long before that RFP hits the streets. And so we're going to talk about that. And um, there's four key tips that I'm going to give to you. So let me tell you what those are. The very first one is very simply stay on scope of the RFP. You are in there. You are in the trenches with the contract. You've probably had a lot of scope creep or at least some minimal scope creep. Maybe you've been able to upsell and be able to do some things to get your contract extended from a price perspective, from a cost perspective. But if you find that the RFP has not integrated those scope creeps or those additional things, then you need to go back to the basics and bid what they're asking for. Because if you bid on everything that you're doing, you're going to outprice yourself. And let me tell you, there's competition waiting in the wings to steal that contract from you. I know it, I've seen it, and I've seen it happen successfully over and over and over. So you don't want them to be able to steal your contract. And if they way underbid you, that's one key way they're possibly going to be able to steal your contract. So you've got to make sure that the evaluators are going to have apples to apples to compare to. So be very careful to not scope creep. Even though you know that it's going to scope creep, put something in there separately, put a caveat in. When you write the executive summary for the cost volume, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and listen to the the podcast that I did with Marsha Lindquist, she had some really great advice to do an executive summary for your cost volume, your cost proposal. So where it's allowed, do that and indicate in there, you know, as you know, we work with this contract now, we have had some additional projects come up that are not scoped in this particular RFP. Please note that we have not priced for these, something along those lines to make sure that they know that you know that there's additional stuff, but that you're not pricing for it. So that's number one. Stay on scope within the RFP, all right? Number two is remind them what it's like to work with you. So here's what's interesting. Whenever I am reviewing an incumbent RFP, it's amazing how we kind of go back to being really buttoned up and we go back to making it sound like we don't know who they are, but you do know who they are. So share some of that. Now, I get that you don't want to show all your cards because, again, in a government proposal, your competitors can get a copy of this and they can glean a lot of information. So there's a balance. I get that. But don't just go in and pretend like they don't know who you are. I was reviewing one recently where the staff was just talking about, you know, we're going to be assigning so-and-so to your account. He's got this much experience. He does this, this, and this. Well, I've been working with him for five years. So... You know, you can say things like, as you know, you know, Joe has been an instrumental member of your team because of his knowledge in X, Y, and Z. So make it a little bit more personable. Kind of remind them of what it's like to work with you. 
as you know, Joe is on the ground with you, you know, every other week. He's in your office. He's available, you know, to answer your calls. And you might even want to give an example of a time where he answered a critical call in an off hour on a Saturday or on a Sunday that really helped them out in a bind, something like that. So you want to remind them of what it's like to work with you. Don't just pretend like all of a sudden you guys don't know each other. I see it all the time. Please don't do that. All right. Really, the the other one, number three, is don't act like you don't know them. So I kind of combine those two together. But where the separation is, is that remind remind them of what it's like to work with you and also don't act like you don't know them. So those are really two separate things. But you want to make sure that you delineate there. And really, again, sometimes you've got to hold their hand. And I say this a lot in any proposals that you're doing in any RFP responses. You want to hold their hand and guide them through your process. When you already have the contract, you're just reminding them. So you're still painting that picture, but they're going to be able to visualize it so much easier because they already work with you. And so don't have it be as third party feeling. Have it have it be integrated so that they remember, oh yeah, you know, we really love working with them. They do give us this sense of partnership. And then you're really not acting like you don't know them. That's ridiculous. And I see it all the time. All right. And then the fourth piece of the puzzle here is that you want to share successes. And this is the piece of the puzzle that you've got to be tracking from day one of that contract. Because I tell you what, three years or five years down the road, you're not going to remember anything, nor is your client that happened prior to the last two or three weeks or any of the big stuff. They'll remember some of the big stuff, but they're going to remember the last two or three weeks and you're going to have to remind them. This goes a little bit hand in hand with the remind them what it's like to work with you. But here I'm talking about concrete successes and this doesn't have to be big stuff. You want to start collecting even the small stuff. If you get an email from one of the team members that says, you just saved my bacon, you want to save that. So have a folder for, you know, XYZ client successes and toss emails in there and toss notes in there so that you remember three to five years down the road when, when you're getting ready to write this response. You've got a whole file full of really great successes that you can remind them of. And you know, if you remind them of something that happened three years ago, again, you know, maybe you got them out of a bind or, you know, remind them that, hey, you know what, you, we were there in your offices late one night and your copy machine broke and you guys had a project that was completely irrelevant to our contract, but one of your staff members was in a bind and one of our team members ran this down to Kinko's and saved their butt. You know, something like that. We've all got those stories, but we forget about them. And we forget about the time that a team member said, oh my gosh, I don't know what I would do without you. Or that you talked a team member off a ledge because they were really struggling. Or that you know you, you helped them out with a Word document that they couldn't figure out. I mean, it doesn't have to be huge. It can be these little tiny small nuances. Who Don't overthink whether you should save it or not. Just save it all. And then when it comes time to to rebid on that, you can pull all of that out and use those as little call out boxes or have a separate section that says, hey, we just want to remind you that we love this partnership that we have with you. And here are some of the really great things that we've been able to do together over the past three to five years and have it be really kind of a cool two to three page layout of graphic, you know, visually appealing with some nice graphics and it just helps them remember and then you can sprinkle some of that throughout in your cover letter, your executive summary. Because again, if you think about this, if you are the contract holder, it is yours to lose. And even if in the last month you've ticked off your client and you're really worried because you're like, oh, things have not been going well recently, maybe for the first two and a half years it was beautiful and everything went really well and now all of a sudden you've hit a couple of speed bumps. Well, remind them of those two and a half years. So there's a lot of magic that can happen there. There is no reason if you follow these four things that somebody should be able to take the contract away from you, unless you've just been doing a shitty job. 
<laughs> Let's face it. If you've been doing a crappy job of servicing that client and you know, fulfilling your contract, then all bets are off. But if you've been doing a good job and they've been enjoying working with you, you've got the most information. You've already got the relationship. Change and transition is hard. So why would they want to do that? No, they wouldn't unless you've really screwed up or unless somebody comes in and shows that they want it more or somebody comes in and completely lowballs you. So you've got to keep those things in mind. So those four tips, make sure you're paying attention to those when you are bidding on your own contract when you're doing a rebid and get that success, get that bid back, it's yours to lose. All right, everybody, this has been Lisa Reherick with the RFP Success Show. And if you like what you're hearing, subscribe, leave a review, share it with your colleagues. I know there's not always a lot of information out there on how to be successful with RFPs. That is our goal to continue to bring you great information so that you can continue to do better and win more. Signing off, this is Lisa Reherick. You have been listening to the RFP Success Show with RFP expert, Lisa Rehurick, author of the RFP Success Book. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet, make sure you click the subscribe button so you don't miss a show. And thanks for spending time with us today.